right, so we're going to go ahead and talk about lab equipment today, folks. It's going to be a great time. Uh, check out this little graduate so He's like, experiments, yay. Look at him, Mr. Poacher Slimey. Woo. Okay, all right, anyways. Here we go. You do not need to write this down unless you're feeling like it. But these are all the things that we're going to go through today. Test tube rack, test tube holder, test tube breast. There's all, all kinds of stuff, okay? Now, for every single one of these things we talk about today, you need to know two things. Don't worry, this isn't on your notes yet. The next slide will be though. You need to know two things today. You can write this at the top. You need to know the name and the use of every single thing we talk about today. So if I hold something up, you better be able to tell me that's a blah, 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 and it's used for blah, blah, blah. Okay? You need to know. People in the recording are like, what did he just say? The sound cut out. Um, so, I want to be very clear about this. On the Unit 1 test, which is several weeks from now, which is several weeks from now, on the Unit 1 test, I will hold up two objects on that test, like during the test. I'll be like, what is this? What does it do? Or sometimes I, I like to say, would it be, would it do? Okay. Let's play, would it be, would it do? Come on down. Okay, so I will do that with two different things. So, from this moment on, anything we say in class, do in class, practice in class, go over in class, is fair game for the Unit 1 test. So, Unit 1 starts now. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about it. Number one, b -b 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 beaker tongs. Oh, and there's the other two, I guess. Huh? Raise it for now. Beaker tongs, beaker tongs, beaker tongs. One of the most common objects you will use in the laboratory this year. Here they are, boing, boing, boing. They're kind of shaped like a pear. You'll notice that they have rubber on the ends. They have rubber on the ends. Right here for you kids at home, that is rubber. Beaker tongs, that's what it is, what it do. Beaker tongs, move beakers. They move beakers. Holy cow, that's crazy. They move beakers. Uh, oftentimes, the beaker is hot. We don't want to touch it. You did this during the gold penny lab, if you may recall that. I'm like, that thing is hot. You probably don't want to touch it. So you kind of grab it like, uh-huh, yes, mm-hmm, look at me, all in the wrist. If you want to be real fancy, sometimes you'll do the palm up and you'll grab it like this because you might need to pour it a little bit. And be like, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Beaker tongs. Next up, we got crucible tongs. Crucible tongs, crucible tongs. Yep, yep, yep. Boom. Here they are. Slightly different shape. All metal, all metal, all metal. No rubber. All metal. See that? Okay. Crucible tongs. Move. Well, I just put like test tube now. Crucibles. They move crucibles. They move crucibles, usually because the crucible is super duper hot. We'll talk about crucible later today, but here's how you do it with crucible tongs. You'd be like, yep, yeah, uh-huh. You kind of grab it gently like this. And here we go. See that? Wonderful. Do not, do not, do not, don't laugh, Sophia. Do not use a crucible tong to move a beaker, and do not use beaker tongs to move a crucible. You will break something, and it could be you or the equipment or both. Either way, I won't be thrilled. Hey, here's, a, here's beaker tongs with your crucible. You can't do it, okay? So don't do that. You'll just knock it over. And if I see you take some crucible tongs and, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my mind. You're definitely going to break the beaker or knock it over or spill it, whatever. Now, I would never tell you what's going to be on the test. I would never say something like, one of these will definitely be on the test. I would never say something like that. Like, you should definitely know what one of these are. I would never say, but one of these could be on the test. You understand? You understand what I'm telling you right now? Okay, good talk. Now, you will be using beaker tongs more often than, it's like a top five item in terms of how much you're going to use it this year. So it's really important that you do know the difference between crucible tongs and beaker tongs because so you don't want to have an unnecessary accident. Okay? So, those beaker tongs, crucible tongs. Next up, we got a burette clamp. A burette clamp. Here is a burette clamp. I'm going to go ahead and put this guy around for a second. This is a burette clamp, what I'm putting my left hand on right now, okay? A burette clamp holds burettes, which is what number four is, and which is what is being held right now. This guy is a burette, 
Okay, that guy's a burette, and a burette clamp holds that. Now, um, burettes, here's how they work. You'll usually have them attached to something like this. So, kind of screw that on there, nice and tight. And um, if you want to get a little something out of here, you can kind of turn this like this. Mr. P, do I have to know how to use that on the test? No, 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 because you won't use this in the lab for a while. You should know what it does. But I will show you how to properly use this down the road, okay? But a burette is used to measure precise, precise, precise volumes. Precise volumes, okay? You can measure down to the hundredths of a milliliter with a burette, they are very precise. You know exactly how much you are adding of whatever volume you're using, which will probably be a base like sodium hydroxide when we get to unit seven, we're talking about titrations and the pink color and don't kill Patrick Star. And it's a whole thing. We'll get to that, but it'll be a while. Next up, we've got Bunsen burners. What's Bunsen? Some dead guy's last name. Um, Bunsen burner. Oh uh, yeah, Mr. Pete, what if on a test I accidentally plop like an eye right there? Um, that is not something I'm really going to care about, like minor spelling errors. Um, however, if you spell Bunsen burner, B7Q26 blue, hut hut on six, okay? That will probably be marked wrong because I have no idea what you're talking about, okay? But small spelling errors, not a big deal. A Bunsen burner is this guy right here, okay? If you turn on the gas when you attach it, you can maybe hear if you're kind of close. Um, we will light that gas because we use these to heat reactions. Now, R-E-A-C-T-I-O-N-S, or I sometimes abbreviate reactions with R-X-N-S. First time my college professor did that, blew my mind. Reactions. If you ever spell like that on test, I got no problem with that, but your English teacher might. So, you've been warned. Um, but yes, Bunsen burners are used to heat things. You will use Bunsen burners maybe more than anything else. They're way up there. On your unit one test, so uh, let's say you're Laura, it's so unit one test. Part of your test will be like, Laura, come up here, please. I'd like you to light this Bunsen burner right in front of me and get the perfect flame. That will be part of your test, worth about five or six points, I think, something like that. I will train you how to light these Bunsen burners this week. We'll have Bunsen burner day. It's a good time. I bust out a flamethrower. It's a whole thing. But yes, you will be lighting those. The reason why I make you light those on the unit one test is because you have to use them so many times in lab. It would be a big waste of time if Ryan has to spend seven minutes trying to get her Bunsen burner lit and get the perfect flame. Whereas where you will be is you'll be able to light get a perfect flame in like 30 seconds, no problem. You don't waste time doing it when you have other stuff to do in lab. Make sense? So that's why we do it early on. Another dead guy's last name, Erlen Meyer Flask. I have seen so many spellings of Erlenmeyer on the test. As long as you are in the neighborhood, we are okay. An Erlenmeyer flask is used for mixing. Not, 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 measuring. Wow, that's pretty sus. Going down the side there. Not measuring, not measuring. Don't do it, don't do it. Do not do it. Do not measure in this. Here's an Erlenmeyer flask. It's sort of the science fiction -y thing. Look at that. My wrist barely moved, but look how much you can swirl it. You can really mix this puppy. Ugh. Whew. Okay. Uh, Mr. P, it has numbers on it. What do you mean it's not used for measuring? These numbers, it even says approximately right there, are just ballparks, okay? So Sarah's like, oh, I got like 150 milliliters of stuff. Can I use this one? Like, oh, it's got, it can hold about 250. Okay, yeah, so this one should be good to go, okay? But and another time, Sarah might be like, I have 400 milliliters. Can I use it? Uh, yeah, this one's probably not big enough because it holds about 250, okay? So this is just a ballpark to let you know the general size, but you should never measure with one of these. You should only mix. You should only mix. I always love it on the test. You know, if you're a little Kaylana, right? Where she's like, mixing, not measuring, all capital letters. Love to see it. You'll love to see it. You know what I mean? So... Not mixing, okay? Here we go. Next one, clay triangle. What a creative name. Clay triangle. Where is my clay triangle? It is in this drawer, my hardware drawer. Boom! This is a clay triangle. A clay triangle is often used with a crucible, which we'll talk more about here in a second. 
But you'll usually have a setup like this. Maybe you have a clay triangle set like that. You pop a little crucible right there. A clay triangle is used to support crucible heating. Support crucible heating. Okay? So that's what a clay triangle is for. Um, crucible and lid. So you guys have already seen that. A lot of times they'll have a lid like this. What I have right there is a ceramic crucible. I'm hoping to use the metal crucibles for the most part this year. So if you have a crucible like this, you can use your, you can use your, you can use your, you can use your, uh, your uh, crucible tongs. That's right. And you can pick up the crucible with this. Boom. Woo! Careful. Like so. Just gotta grab it carefully. Uh, and these are also nice. They have like little pinch at the end, so you can grab lids. That's why I have the little pinch. Okay. You can do the same with this guy. It's kind of hard going through here, but oh, easy does it. I don't like the ceramic crucibles that much. They break pretty easily. So I'm hoping to not actually have to use them this year, but we might. So that's why I'm showing them to you now. Okay. So anyways, they're used to heat. Keyword right here: dry, dry, dry chemicals. Mr. P, how come we don't use wet chemicals, quote unquote, in crucibles? Two reasons. Number one, um, these crucibles are often a little bit fragile. So if you have something boiling and kind of moving along here, it might crack. So we don't want that. And secondly, um, this is pretty small. If you have something boiling in here, it may very easily pop out of this. This doesn't really work that well. Okay. So only dry stuff. So you might put a powder in there. For example, you might take some blue powder called copper sulfate in the Unit 7 lab where you're trying to figure out how many waters are attached to it, and you're going to dehydrate that. It's going to turn white. It's a great time. But anyway, do only put a powder or something else dry in there. Make sense? All right. Funnel. Funnel. Uh, that's used to transfer chemicals. Transferring chemicals there. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. This one you've probably seen before. Here's a funnel. See how it's got a small hole, pretty tiny hole right there? That is best for liquids, like so. Uh, but you can also use the bigger ones if you need to transfer like a powder. So if you want to get all the powder in here, you don't want to have it go on the sides, you can transfer it using this guy with the bigger hole. Does that make sense? So funnels transfer things. You got goggles here. Boom. Goggles protect eyes. Protects eyes from chemicals or fumes. So sometimes they can protect you from fumes. There's three flavors of glasses. You can use normal ones right here. Boom. Um, if you wear glasses, usually my glasses folks prefer these little bit bigger ones. Sometimes, depending on the size or shape of their glasses, they'll like these smaller ones, okay? So glasses, folks, you can pick which one you use, but most of you guys seem to like these guys better. If you not have glasses like Anthony over here, please don't ever grab one of these. These are reserved for our glasses, folks. There's only like six or seven pairs. So if you don't wear glasses, you shouldn't ever use one of these. When we bring out the heavy-duty stuff, whether you have glasses or not, we will be popping on the scuba goggles, okay? They will leave a ring around your face. Your foundation will be messed up, and you will look like a raccoon for the rest of the day. It is what it is, okay? That's how you can always spot a, a freshman at Ohio State. They got some serious raccoon face sometimes. It is funny to judge. Anyways, um, these are for when we pull out the big guns, like um, so maybe some three molar hydrochloric acid. That would be very bad if you got in your eyes, so we want to make sure we have a little bit extra protection those days. If I ever need you to wear scuba goggles, I will have them sitting out for you, ready to grab as you walk in. Does that make sense? So you assume when I say, get your goggles, talking about the ones over there, unless I specifically say scuba goggles. Okay? All righty. A pipette. I don't know why the last E decided to migrate down here. It should be there. I don't know what happened. Um, pipette uh, is used to transfer small volumes. Transfer small volumes. Okay? Here's how a pipette works. 
you squeeze the top little bulb like this when it's empty, and then you stick it into a volume. And if you let go, it'll draw some of that liquid up like that. Okay. And if you want to get it out, you squeeze it again. So sometimes when you add, you want to add a very small amount to something. Now notice this can't measure. Okay. But let's say you're using a graduated cylinder, for example. We haven't even got to those yet. But let's say you're trying to measure something. Okay. And you just like. Oh, oh, it's almost at the three. I just want to add a teeny bit more. So you're like, mm, plop, 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 something like that. Okay, it's good for adding a very small amount of something. Good for adding a very small amount of something. Always liquid volume. You'd never get a pipe cut, and, or I'm sorry, you'd never get something dry in there, of course. Okay, so there's that. Um, let me see here. Let me see here. Mortar and pestle. Mortar and pestle. Uh, so this is used to grind, dry chemicals. So sometimes you got a big chunk of something, it won't fit in your funnel. And so you get a mortar and pestle, you chop, toss it in there, and you kind of grind it down so it's like a fine powder and it'll go through your dry funnel. No problem. We won't use those very often, but that is what they are for. Watch glass! We got a watch glass here. Watch glasses are used for a couple of things. Okay, they can hold very small reactions. So sometimes you'll put a reaction on here so you can kind of get a really nice look at it. It's got a clear background to it. It spreads reaction out. So if you're looking for really tiny, like let's say you're looking for tiny, tiny bubbles. Sometimes you might want to do it on here so you can get a good look at it. The other thing you'll use a wash glass for is to cover beakers, like so. Because maybe you have some fumes come out of beakers, you want to get those to calm down. Sometimes if something's on fire, the easiest way to put it out is just to plop a wash glass on top because you're taking away its source of oxygen and it puts it out. So a wash glass, you can cover beakers, but you can also hold small reactions. All right. Now let's see here, Andrew. I'm about to ask you a very difficult question, okay? Are you ready? Yes. What do you think a stirring rod is used for? Uh, Be careful. Maybe stirring. You got it, my guy. Look at this man. All right. He doesn't even need to take this class. Yes, stirring rod. And we're stirring. And we're stirring. Uh-huh. This is me. Isn't that great? That's not annoying at all. There you go. Stir, 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 stir. You'll probably do that a lot. You'll be using a lot of these, by the way, for a lab that is a competition this week. So exciting, the mixing lab. Wait, who am I competing against? Well, your partner's on your team, and everyone else is against you. Nice. So Sarah's like, Danielle's got my back, but all of you other guys, okay. Anyways. So that's your stirring rod. You got a test tube. This is a, sort of a kind of the stereotypical chemistry stuff kind of thing. Test tube, plop, here it is. Looks like that. A test tube doesn't measure, doesn't really mix either. Uh, it's really just to hold small reactions. So it's got a similar purpose as the watch glass. A test tube can definitely hold more stuff than a watch glass, and we use a test tube much more than a watch glass, but they're usually just to hold stuff. You will be using test tubes this week for the mixing lab. All right. Hey, uh, you just walked across the stage. Someone handed you a diploma. You are graduated cylinder. Yeah, see what I did there? See what I did there? Graduated cylinder. You got two flavors of graduated cylinder. You got the little fella, 10 milliliters, okay, for measuring really small amounts. So if you need 10 milliliters or less of something, you'd use this guy. You also got the big fella. If you need somewhere in between 100 and 0 milliliters, you'd probably use this guy. So if I want to use measure out 29 milliliters, I'd probably go for this. I could do it with the small guy, but that would be three different measurements. So I have three different opportunities to make a mistake instead of just one. So, there you go. These are both in your drawer. You'll use them both this week. You will eventually. Boom, boom, boom. So, yes, they 
measure, oopsie, measure volumes. So they are good for measuring. Unlike their OMIR flask, which is not good for measuring, mixing only. Evaporating dish. So if you have a solid and a liquid together, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you can use an evaporating dish to separate those two. How do you do that, Mr. P? Well, here's what an evaporating dish looks like. It's got a nice wide base, so it has a lot of surface area to it. You can pour your solid liquid in here, and lots of times the liquid could just evaporate out of here, and then the solid would be left over, so that's how you can use it to sort of separate a solid and a liquid. We won't use this very often, but that is what it's for, separating solid and liquid. And there are other techniques to separate solids and liquids. That's just a very simple, very easy one where it doesn't require any machinery or anything like that. This guy right here, this is going to be your new best friend, ring, stand, and clamp. You, <laughs> oh, if your first grade teacher told you, like, hey, this is addition, one plus one, you have no idea how many times you're going to do this in your life. In the same way, ring stand clamp, you have no idea how many times you're going to use a ring stand clamp this year. Oh, so many times. Oh, so many times. Okay? You have actually been looking at it this whole time. This is a ring stand and clamp. Now, let me point out specifically which one is which. These two pieces right here are the ring stand. So the rod and the base, this is the ring stand, like these together are the ring stand. They are always separate in your drawer because they can't fit in your drawer if they're together. Okay, nice squeaky sound, probably sounds great for the kids at home. This is a ring clamp, okay, ring clamp, clamps on there. You have a small ring clamp, you have a big ring clamp, interestingly enough. The big ring clamp usually goes on top. I will teach you more about this when we talk about the standard apparatus and Bunsen burn later this week. Okay. But those are used to support heating. Support heating in general because what you'll be doing is you'll end up usually with a Bunsen burner under here. You'll have some chemicals up here and you'll use those to support that heating. Woo! All right. Oh, we're to the back page, finally. Goodness. Oh, man. All right. It's been a long time. Talking for 22 minutes. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay, let's go ahead and continue. Next up, we have number 19. We got the wire gauze. Wire gauze. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. Wire gauze is gauze made out of wire, <laughs> I guess. Here's what it looks like. You'll plop it right there, let's say. And here's what it does. It is used for even, that's a key word, not odd, even heating. Even heating. The moment the flame hits the center of this wire gauze, the heat sprints to the edges. Okay? So it gives a nice even heating for whatever it is you're heating. So lots of times you'll have something like this, and you'll have like a beaker, like right there. What that means, though, is that moments after you light that flame, the edges are very hot. So you need to be very careful, okay? I had a girl, um, she had her pencil and just slow, slightly touched the edge right here, like it wasn't that close to the flame. Melted the pencil clean, like cut right through it, okay? So just, it was a mechanical pencil, not a wood one. Just be careful, because it's even heating, it will be very hot, even on the edges. So just watch out for that. The middle will turn red, and you can tell it's hot, but the edges won't. So, you better warn it, okay? Uh, the four steps, you can also say tweezers. I'll accept tweezers if you say that. They're used to pick up small objects. Pick up small objects, okay? Pick up small objects that you probably shouldn't touch, like a hot penny, something like that. This guy right here, you got a wash bottle. This is just for rinsing things like this. Let's say you got a little bit of stuff stuck on this beaker. Wash bottle, good for that. All right. You got this guy, test tube holder. Okay, you can write those other ones down too. Test tube holder, it's just this little metal guy. Looks like this. You squeeze it like this, and it opens up, and you let go, and it grabs the test tube. Here's how you can move a test tube if it's hot, and you don't want to touch it. So test tube holders move test tubes. A beaker can hold reactions, but not measure. 
Hold reactions, but not measure, okay? So just like our own Meyer flask, you should never measure with a beaker. Why does it have numbers, Mr. P? To let you know about how much it can hold, okay? And generally speaking, you don't want to make this more than half full. So you don't want to have a 400 milliliter beaker be have more than about 200 milliliters of stuff in. If you have 210, that's not a big deal. It's just a rule of thumb, about halfway is the max. A utility clamp, um, that's just used to hold things for heating. So, like, here's what a utility clamp looks like. Boom. You can use it to grab test tubes around like that. So let's say I want to heat up a test tube, you can use it like that, that kind of thing. So it holds round objects. Test tube rack holds test tubes. It's wooden. It's right there in front of my desk. This guy's a thermometer, and you should always be in degrees Celsius in this class. Always degrees Celsius in this class. This guy that looks like a cat's tail. I do have a fat cat named Cat who doesn't have a tail, but she did have a tail when I got her, which is a story for another day how she lost it. Uh, but yes, here's a test tube brush. You can use it to clean out a test tube. They are around the room, actually. So if you look at the sink right behind Ryan, you'll see that there's a test tube brush hanging up behind her. They're all around the room, though. And lastly, we have the scoopula and the spatula. The scoopula is that guy. The spatula is that guy. Those two are both used to move or you know, transfer small, dry chemicals. Okay, that's all they're used for. Uh, here's what they look like. The scoop you love has like a nice little scoop shape to it. You can use this to get a few grams of something. The spatula is flat, the flat spat chula. It's used for really tiny amounts. So you just get like a little tiny amount and just tap, 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 that kind of thing. All righty. Well, that's it for our notes today. You guys are going to hop in your drawers here in a second. I'm going to go ahead and pause the lecture video because we're all done.